Hello, friends. This is Scott Monty. Stand by for commentary. Welcome to The Full Monty, where you'll be exposed to commentary and analysis from the week's digital news. You give us 15 minutes, and we'll save you hours. And now, here's your host, Scott Monty. Hi, and welcome to The Full Monty, an audio companion to the newsletter of the same name. Each week, I pick a couple of the more pressing issues and inject some insight, opinion, and wit into this 15-minute show that's sure to give you a better sense of what's affecting the industry. Maybe you'll agree with me, maybe you won't, but I hope it makes you think. This week, how Wells Fargo could have avoided a long, drawn-out drama, and gates are for prisons, not content. Critical Crisis Criteria There have been no lack of corporate crisis management issues lately. From Mylan Laboratories and their price increase scheme, to Samsung's exploding Galaxy Note 7 phones, to last year's EPA cheating scandal with Volkswagen, each has been an example of company-induced issues that played out in painstakingly slow motion in public. But one of the worst offenders is Wells Fargo's shameless and blatant profiteering at the expense of the little guy. The company was responding to Wall Street's consistent pressure for greater profits by creating a culture devoid of ethics that would find any way to squeeze another dollar out of customers. In this case, some 5,300 middle managers were fired over the course of five years for their involvement in upselling some 2 million accounts to customers who neither needed them nor could afford them. And during that time, some of the bank's top executives earned hundreds of millions of dollars in salary, bonuses, and stock options. At a session before the United States Senate Banking Committee in September, Wells Fargo CEO John Stumpf was pilloried by a number of senators from both sides of the aisle who called the actions worthy of fraud and gutless leadership. His stonewalling and repetition of the same lawyer-supplied statement did not assuage any of the senators' anger. Indeed, it probably infuriated them even further. One of the phrases that consistently stood out to me was when Stumpf kept saying, I take full responsibility. When Senator Elizabeth Warren asked him if he would resign or give back all of the additional money he had made based on the market's reaction to Wells Fargo's earnings, he declined to do so. We see this constantly with politicians and business leaders alike saying, I take full responsibility. Well, I don't know about you, but I was raised to believe that taking responsibility meant more than just saying something. It meant doing something as well, whether it was to take action, to make up for the wrongdoing, or to receive some kind of punishment. The word responsibility has its origins in the Latin word responsus, meaning an answer or reply. But in the case of those who simply state they're responsible, or even worse, in Stump's case, who wouldn't answer questions? That's no reply at all. With responsibility comes the concepts of accountability and trustworthiness. And without bearing responsibility, there can be no trust. So finally, the hammer dropped and John Stump resigned as CEO of Wells Fargo. But it was too little, too late. The public saw this as an action that should have been taken by the board immediately after the hearings. But as usual, what happened is you had a formula that we see over and over again in most major corporate crises. An insular culture, executives who have served decades at the company, largely untested by any major scandal. Their myopia keeps them completely unaware of how they're perceived by the big, by the rest of the world until it's too late. And then they're shocked. Meanwhile, the public has learned to distrust big anything, big pharma, 
big oil, big auto, big banks. And that's where we're left with Wells Fargo. There's a complete breakdown of trust based on this being a textbook example of how not to handle a crisis. The company now says that it has listening tours planned, along with regular memos to and videos to employees, and increased proactive communication with large investors. Did you hear anything about customers or the general public in that plan? It's a completely missed opportunity. You think about the legendary corporate crisis, the 1982 Tylenol incident with Johnson & Johnson. The company led with what has now become the gold standard for handling any corporate crisis. Step up to the crisis with full public disclosure. Apologize for the occurrence. Identify the root cause. And then implement disciplined plans to fix the problems permanently. But instead, you have a bank that underestimated the public and government anger at its practices in general, and specifically with this situation. And then they responded with a tin ear, leading to the necessary expulsion of their CEO. Again, Wells Fargo demonstrated that it was completely out of touch, which led to the issue evolving slowly, gaining considerable steam as it did so. So instead of the issue getting buried, as their executives likely hoped that it would, it became a full-blown crisis, destroying what was left of the banking institution's reputation. And now, as they have an opportunity to recover, they're squandering it by ignoring the need to rebuild public trust. And they seem overly fixated on employees and investors. What will they do to have the public believe in Wells Fargo, that company that had its origins in the expansion of the American West. When will their stagecoach begin running on time again? If they can figure out how to apply modern digital era crisis management to their expertise, they might be in a better place. Although the Wells Fargo wagon is coming down the street, oh, don't let him pass my door. Get your trivia skills ready for the Naked Truth. This week's Naked Truth trivia question. In the newsletter, we have an article about the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network. What's the name of the first show they produced? Answer at the end of the show. And now, page two. Tear down that content gate. Mr. Gorbachev... Tear down this wall. You've probably had a customer experience or two that has soured you on a company, right? Something that's rubbed you the wrong way or perhaps flown in the face of logic that simply stops you in your tracks and causes you to wonder, how could a company expect me to do business with them when they behave like this? Well, it doesn't matter whether it was a customer service call, an interaction with an employee in a store, or an online process, if it's enough to make you question them, then it's enough to send you to a competitor. Or, in some cases, the effect is that you're more content to have no product or service at all, rather than deal with an inferior experience. In fact, 62% of global customers have stopped doing business with a brand or organization due to poor customer service experiences. That's according to Paracher's 2015 Global State of Multi-Channel Customer Service Report. When you're greeted with regular occurrences like the seven deadly sins of social media marketing, is it any surprise? You know the seven deadly sins. Pride, sloth, gluttony, greed, wrath, lust, and envy. Earlier this week, we were enticed by a marketing resource that was promoted by a publication we subscribed to. Its marketing partner promised eight ultimate examples of omni-channel customer experiences. All right, well, when we clicked through to get the guidebook, we were greeted with ten requirements. First name, last name, email, company name, company type, job title, country, monthly ad spend, CRM solution, and what else you would like to hear about from them. 
Well, upon arriving at the lead page, we were prepared to see some helpful content. Instead, it was gated, gated content. The tariff for our desired education, no less than 10 pieces of information, as you heard. Needless to say, we abandoned any intention of getting the content. Next time, start asking for a first name and an email address, and maybe develop a relationship from there. Not only is that overkill, i.e. greed, but it puts the onus on the customer rather than on the marketer. The marketer should be in the business of building interest and trust over time. In other words, it's lazy. Boom. Greed and sloth. Two deadly sins in one form. Now, this isn't all that uncommon, unfortunately. According to Starfleet Media's B2B content marketing and lead generation report, respondents estimate they keep 80% of their major content marketing assets gated. 80%. We're not calling for a complete release of all content, but we understand the importance of getting vital information from your intended audience. But there's some considerations before you put that gate in place. Some questions you might ask yourself before gating content. Is the content valuable? Is it available anywhere else for free, such as a competitor's website? What's the minimum information we need from a visitor? And what do we plan to do with the visitor's information? See, the thing is, most businesses don't intentionally try to upset customers, but invariably, there are numerous decision makers involved, and as a result, the process becomes corrupted. Or perhaps an outdated process is simply kept in place because the waditwa, that's, we've always done it that way. The resultant subpar customer or user experience leads to more people turning away from your content than if you had asked for less information. In some cases, it's a matter of internal teams not spending enough time on the UX as consumers do themselves. In other cases, managers would simply avoid any internal skirmishes between departments. In other words, it's easier to deal with dissatisfied customers, or fewer customers, than it is to campaign against a strong-willed oppositional colleague. Ultimately, you need to ask yourself not what bits of information you want customers to share, but what you're willing to give up to gain customers. Some relish the greed of anything for leads, and are content with a content gate. If you seek to persist with input-heavy lists, you'll find that you have to wait. We asked you about the first show produced by the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network. That would be Grammar Girl, hosted by QDT founder Mignon Fogarty. If you have an editorial you would like us to read on the show, please get in touch with us at fullmontyshow at scottmonty.com. And if you've enjoyed this series, please consider becoming a patron and showing your support at patreon.com slash scottmonty. And we'll always welcome a rating or a review on iTunes. Be sure to check out other major news stories from the October 17th edition of our newsletter. The Wall Street Journal is reorganizing its newsroom as it aims to reach 3 million digital subscribers. The result will be shorter, snappier, and more creative stories. Facebook launched Workplace, formerly known as Facebook at Work. It's a competitor to Yammer and Slack. And according to June Research, U.S. marketing and media professionals will allocate an average of 11.6 of their ad budget and inventory to digital audio placements by mid-2017, doubling the share of investment made just two years earlier. Hey, how about putting some of that money into the full Monty? Well, that's all for this week. With any luck, your brain is a bit bigger now. Thank you for making me a part of your week and for being exposed to the full Monty. Until next time, I'm Scott Monty, and I'll see you on the Internet. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the Full Monty newsletter and this program at fullmontyshow.com.
You'll only get a closing comment if I have your email address.